For nearly two centuries, societies have weighed the merits of free market capitalism and socialism. Debates continue over which system maximizes prosperity and better promotes human flourishing. Free market capitalism decentralizes economic decisions, giving individuals control over what to produce, how much to charge, and what to buy. Their decisions are informed by market prices, which convey important information about scarcity and consumer value. Proponents contend that capitalism delivers the best economic outcomes by giving individuals incentives to create and produce. Critics, on the other hand, point to the persistence of poverty in market economies and rising inequality as proof that capitalism fails to deliver broad-based prosperity. They maintain that this inequality ultimately gives the rich disproportionate economic and political power. In contrast, socialism grants the government the authority to make most economic decisions. The government chooses how to allocate scarce resources based upon what it determines to be most useful to society as a whole. Proponents argue that socialism ensures society's resources are fairly distributed. Critics claim that socialism fails to give people proper economic incentives to innovate and produce, which ultimately reduces economic opportunities for all. Opponents further argue that socialism's powerful central governments become autocratic and threaten political freedom. So which system is better for humanity? For as long as this question has been asked, the debate all too often devolves into name-calling and emotional arguments that fail to advance the discussion. And yet, it is imperative that we keep asking. The Human Prosperity Project at the Hoover Institution seeks to overcome these preconceptions. It employs analysis of free market capitalism and socialism and its many variants to assess how each system affects human flourishing. Welcome to the Human Prosperity Project from Stanford University's Hoover Institution. I'm Russ Roberts, the John and Jean Denault Research Fellow here at Hoover and host of the weekly podcast, Econ Talk. This speaker series is based on research and commentary from Hoover scholars participating in the Human Prosperity Project on socialism and free market capitalism. The overarching goal of this project is to investigate the historical record to assess the consequences for human welfare, individual liberty, and interactions between nations of various economic systems. Go to hoover.org, hoover.org, to find long form essays, short videos, commentary, and this speaker series. During today's presentation, you can use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to submit questions. I'm joined today by two Hoover colleagues, George Schultz and John Taylor to discuss free market capitalism and policy lessons from their recently published book, Choose Economic Freedom. Both have written papers on this topic avail available at hoover.org. George Schultz is the Thomas W. and Susan B. Ford Distinguished Fellow at the Hoover Institution. George is one of only two people in American history to have held four different federal cabinet posts, inaugural director of the Office of Management and Budget, Secretary of Labor, Secretary of Treasury, Chairman of the President's Economic Policy Advisory Board and Secretary of State uh, when the Cold War was ending uh, that he played a major role in. George has taught at three of this country's great universities and for eight years he was president of a major engineering and construction company. Our other participant, John Taylor, is the George P. Schultz Senior Fellow in Economics at the Hoover Institution and the Mary and Robert Raymond Professor of Economics at Stanford University. He chairs the Hoover Working Group on Economic Policy and is director of Stanford's Introductory Economic Center. John's fields of expertise are monetary policy, fiscal policy, international economics. His book, Getting Off Track, was one of the first on the financial crisis. His latest book, First Principles, for which he received the 2012 Hyatt Prize, develops an economic plan to restore America's prosperity. I want to start with uh, George Schultz. George, in your essay for this project, you wrote that we are on the, a hinge, a hinge of history. Nice phrase. It does feel that way. And it also feels like part of that hinge is that we are ignoring the importance of prosperity. Why is prosperity so important? Well, obviously you want to have good living and people have a good standard of living and assurance. But in my case, I had observed 
the people who were in charge right after World War II. They were certainly on a hinge of history. The world was destroyed. Nothing was going on of any consequence. When they looked back, what did they see? They saw two world wars. The first one settled in rather vindictive terms, that helped lead to the second. They saw 52 million people were killed in the Second World War. They saw the Holocaust. They saw the Great Depression. They saw the protectionism and currency manipulation that aggravated it. And they said to themselves, what a crummy world. And then they said something different from after World War I, where we walked away from the world. They said, we're part of it, whether we like it or not. So then people with names like Atchison and Truman and Marshall, uh, they took a hold in a different way. That's a much more economic freedom way. <clears throat> Early on, there was the um, meeting at Bretton Woods. 44 countries were there. The object was not for the U.S. to tell everybody what to do. The object was to develop a consensus for what people should do. And out of it came the IMF to look at currency matters, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, designed to get trade tariffs down and trade restrictions down, worked into the WTO. And there was an International Bank for Reconstruction and Development and designed to help people get off their back and get going down the World Trade Organization. World, World Bank, I mean. So these things were all put in place. And they were consistent with the notion of having an economic operation. And basically, they worked. Over a long period of time, these things stayed together, and the world had a period of prosperity that was unprecedented. Now they're coming apart. We have a new problem coming at us. The population is changing drastically. Technology is changing rapidly. It has both economic and War fighting implications. So we're on another hinge of history. What do we do? And I think we want to maintain great attention to the kind of market principles that brought us to a good end in the first time. And we see that in every case. So it was a choice. The government should order people to do something, or the government should organize things and let people figure out how they want to cope with the problem. And always we do better if we go the latter way. So that's what I advocate. That's the experience I get from um, the earlier matter. And actually, when Ronald Reagan came along, we had high inflation. We had the Soviets on our doorstep. We had bad things. And with his smile, he turned it around. We cut taxes. We liberated markets. We stood up to the Soviets. And we wound up winning the Cold War with a prosperous economy, all due to going back to good old market principles. They always win for you. So John, George has pointed out that at one hinge of history, we made a choice, or at least some people made a choice, to push for more open markets and economic freedom. And yet today, we seem to be moving in an opposite direction. In fact, the whole idea of uh, emphasis on growth seems to be off the table. It's not even in the, in the conversation. We're talking about other things. Uh, do you agree with that? And uh, if you do, what can we do to, to change that? And why is it important? Well, Russ, I think there's always been an appeal for something else, something 
perhaps socialism is the word, because uh, some people will benefit, some people will rise to the top, and many others suffer. So I think it's very important uh, for us to keep pointing out the benefits of free markets and the harms that socialism has caused. I think we need lots of examples. Uh, there's examples all around us. This very medium we're using now, Zoom, it's an incredible, powerful mechanism, telemedicine, online purchases, school choice, as our colleague Tom Sold has shown, and many things, many things uh, are there. And um, I think there's also things that we can do to make this system work better. Uh, I think freedom has a lot to do with it, but there's, there's restrictions, there's occupational licensing, there's so-called AB5 in California, and so we need to emphasize the incredible benefits. I haven't heard people discount growth. Uh, I think that other things are on people's minds at this point, but uh, the economy can do better and because it, it makes people's lives better, especially people at the bottom. How do you answer the claim that, that prosperity is nice, but economic growth hasn't translated to a higher standard of living for many Americans, at least according to some? I think it's wrong. I think uh, prosperity has delivered over the over time. And you also can see in countries, take for example, when China adopted market principles, Deng Xiaoping, uh, that was a time where the economy took off. It's done much better than before. Now they seem to be slipping back in another direction. I think the evidence is very clear. Now to be sure, we could do better. I would emphasize the field I'm in, education. Why can't we deliver more at K-12 to people in this country who are not benefiting as much as they can? Can we work on that? And maybe this pandemic will illustrate the harms that come because our educational system is not what it could be. We need to improve that. And I think it goes across the board, but it doesn't mean less free markets, it means more free markets. And that's what should be emphasized. And that's what we need examples, many, many examples. Maybe we're getting lost because of the abstractions that others are using, the hopes that people are pointing out, but it's, it's false. It's a false hope. The benefits come from free markets. Isn't it, it would be great. Can I interject? Go ahead, George. Isn't yeah, sure. Where the charter schools and free to choose atmospheres improve the quality of education. That's just an application of this idea. It works. Yeah, I agree. I, what I was going to say to John is that it, it would be nice if we could have a conversation as to whether the problems that we see around us are the result of too little capitalism or too much. People seem to have jumped to the conclusion that say, poor prospects for children growing up in poor parts of America are due to capitalism, when in fact, I think it's due to poor K through 12 education and other problems that are totally unrelated to capitalism. Or when we look at inequality, some of that inequality is due to crony capitalism, the rewarding of Wall to Wall Street of special favors. And uh, we, need, we need less of that and more of the real thing. Um, I agree. Sure. I just I, I just add that I think this pandemic has made more visible these problems, and the question is now: Do we approach them? Do we do we attack the problems? I think the hope is that people will see this is clear a problem, so we need to address it. Yeah, uh, an audience question is is to try to narrow down what we mean by socialism or capitalism. Uh, when you say the word socialism, John, what do you what do you mean by it? So I mean the opposite of, of freedom. Freedom means a strong rule of law, emphasis on markets, predictable policy, limited role for government. Government has a particular role, but it's limited. And socialism tends to work in the opposite. It's centralized. It's there's someone in in power. Uh, I think it's it's a very good question because the words are bandied about and liberalism has banded about different I think it's best to be specific and I'd say predictability, rule of law, emphasis on markets, uh, limited role for government, those are the keys. And the more we talk about those specifics, I think the better off we'll be. And that's what George and I have tried to do in this book, 
choose economic freedom as a total is the title and there's a lot about economic freedom in there. What is the word, when you use the word socialism uh, and you're criticizing it, what does that word mean to you? What do you think of as your definition of socialism? It's a society where government tells you what to do all the time. You don't decide, the government decides. It's a lousy system. It has a lot of appeal. For instance, this morning I saw in the paper that there were a lot of people who were close to being evicted from their homes because they couldn't pay the rent. And the government was putting out a view that there could be no evictions. That's socialism. You may be in your home and you can't pay the rent, you're going to stay there anyway. I couldn't help but ask myself, what would happen if the government stayed away? Some people would be losing their homes, but the people who own those properties have to fill them up with somebody. So where are they going to get people to fill them up with? And wouldn't it be so that the market would adjust itself a little bit and all those places would be full of people who were paying for them, just let it operate. There's a certain cruelty to that, but uh, it works in the long run, whereas in the shorter run, you can have people in places they can't afford, that's unstable, and the government is accumulating more and more debt. Incidentally, I saw a piece in the paper today that the government debt is as high as our GDP. Wow. And we go on throwing money away at everything. It's quite an achievement. Uh, I want to comment on the eviction uh, example. And John, I want to let you hear what you have to say. I, it just seems to me that while certainly rent control and price controls generally, and, and George, in your essay, you write very eloquently about the mistakes that were made in the 70s with, with those kind of top-down decisions. This case might be a little bit different. Uh, some of those evictions are taking place because people who can't pay can't pay because the government closed the economy. Uh, so in my mind, it's more of a takings example where this would be a case where it might be worthwhile for the government maybe to compensate people so they could pay their rent, compensate them for the losses that they've occurred due to government decisions. John, do you want to react to that? So I think it's incorrect to say it's okay because the government caused it. I think that's not the rationale. The rationale is to get a better policy so that we, we find ways to deal with this in a better way. I think that uh, that's, that's the aim. That's what we're hoping for. And uh, the pandemic itself has called for more government intervention. Sometimes it's wise, sometimes it's not. I think that's probably underlying this new drive that the subject of this talk is about is this new drive for more socialism because all you hear is let's government do this and government do that. You have to look carefully to see what the private sector is doing. That's what I do all the time. I've tried to mention examples. Those examples are not on your nightly news, but they're really changing and, and, and we're in a new world and it's gonna continue. And, and I think that's the promise and uh, it'll be clear to people as long as we communicate about it. You know, we're talking about the definition of socialism uh, my, my definition of what other people mean by socialism is whatever I don't like about capitalism is what I'd rather have. And I'm going to call that socialism. It, it is a very loose term. Uh, it's a little bit of what's sometimes called a suitcase word. You can stuff whatever into it you, you want to stuff. Uh, I think it's important to mention that a lot of the countries, if you're, if you're like me and, and you George and John, when you hear the word socialism, you tend to think of Cuba or Venezuela, uh, North Korea. These are abject failures. People who like socialism, though, are thinking about, say, Sweden or Denmark or Norway. But I think it's important to note that those countries have a huge range of private enterprise and aren't socialist in the sense that we're talking about. George? Sweden is not a socialist country. It's exactly. A very competitive country. You go there and you try to compete with one of those companies, you find yourself in a tough way. They're good. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, that's exactly my point. I, and I agree. John, you want to comment on that? 
No, I th actually, I think there's, there's obvious when you look around the whole world, it's, uh, you know, Venezuela is a disaster area. It's not based on market principles, it's based on uh, central control. And you can see variants on that theme all over the place. You can see it in Africa, you can see it in Asia. I think the evidence is quite striking, but you're right. The words mean a lot. And uh, socialism, I, that's why I try not to say, let's be specific about what works and uh, more markets work and where do they work, show the examples of that. The more we can do rather than the generalities, people like generalities because it makes it vaguer. You can say what you want, but be specific. And that's what we're trying to do. Let's talk about principles and the rule of law. Uh, I think for many people, they, they would defend themselves as being pragmatic. They would go case by case. They wouldn't want to apply principles every time because sometimes you can do better using discretion. Why are rules important and particularly the rule of law? John? Well, I think it's maybe best to go back to the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. It protects freedom of speech. It protects the freedom of press. It protects the freedom of religion. It sets rules for due process. It prevents coercive, arbitrary actions by government. That's its purpose. And I think that's fundamental. It's a fair. People are treated the same. That's the goal. But you know, there's more reasons besides that. The, 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 the world has changed. Now, if you plan ahead and get a good education, you'd like to have some sense that you get the benefits from that, from hard work. And you're rewarded from your from your hard work, and that's not just taken away arbitrarily. I think economic policy, from taxes to regulation, even monetary policy, works best if people know what it is, and that means it's strategic. There's a sense of what's happening. If you like the word rule or strategy, that's what it is. So the more the societies are based on thinking about the future, and that's what's happening. That's technology. The, the more important it is to have a more rules-based approach so people know what's going on. And, and without that, there's a tendency for the powerful to take advantage and uh, to forget about the rule of law, do what's best for them, and that it's harmful. We've seen that in many cases. So I'd go back to the Bill of Rights, the very protection of freedom, religion, and press in the United States. That's very important, but it's broader than that now. Why is the rule of law so important? Because then you know what's proper. You know what you can do and what you can't do. It's universally enforced. And it creates an equal society that uh, means that uh, everybody pays by the same rules. And that allows each of us to make our own plans, which of course- you Make your is plan what being... the rules of the game. Yeah. But you have- it, it's hot opportunity to make your own plan and figure out what you can make work and make profitable and sell in an enterprise. And that's all lawful. You don't have to skirt the law in order to make a head. In fact, if you do skirt the law, probably you get caught. And that's good. Yeah, the, the rule of law properly uh, enforced is what allows permissionless innovation, which is a huge part of our prosperity and, and standard of living. I want to take another question from the audience. Uh, someone asks, we don't, want, we don't want socialism for the whole economy. We don't want the whole economy plan. But isn't it the case that certain sectors should be effectively run by the government, such as health care? Uh, George, should health care be run by the government? No. Look what we've got on our hands right now. The situation is arranged so that sellers don't tell you in advance what the price and the outcome is going to be. And buyers all have insurance. So the system doesn't work well. In Singapore recently, they had that and they changed it. They changed it so that Sellers had to t tell you in advance what your price was and what their record of outcomes is. And buyers were forced to change to health savings accounts from insurance. So they had their own money to spend. So now you've got a market with the buyer and a seller with um, 
incentives and all of a sudden prices come down and the quality of care improves. So we there are changes like that that could be made relatively easily that would make the systems better. And, and, and John, that, but, because we have a lot of really outstanding hospitals and doctors and medical facilities. We are, of course, blessed with one right here at Stanford. Well, George, I think you're 99, if, I, if I've looked at the, the data correctly. And although I'd like to think that Stanford hospitals contributed, I suspect there are other factors that have uh, made your uh, life as long and, and productive as it has been. Yeah, well, I'll be 100 pretty soon, so I, I think I'm going to make it all right. But, uh, we're, all, we're all rooting for you, including the people at Stanford Hospital. Uh, I also want to point out that, that I know George is not an anarchist. <laughs> uh, I know, George, you're worried about climate change. You, don't th you, you believe there's a role for government in lots of areas, just not so much in the economy, correct? But my, here's my approach on climate change. I say, use the power of taxation, set a price, put a price on carbon. And then after you put a price on it, you'll generate revenue and pass that revenue back to everybody who has a social security card in equal amounts. So it's a progressive tax, but it tells everybody who's producing carbon, you gotta pay for it. And then you apply the same approach to incoming goods. The carbon content of something coming in also pays that tax. And that'll straighten people out around the world. And I think that if we do that, we'll get people paying a lot of attention. And then I'm very impressed with the R&D work being done here at Stanford and at MIT where I chair their energy initiative. And I see these people working on things and solar panels are a lot better than they used to be. That's not an accident. That's the result of the R&D that's being done. So I think research on the subject is very important. Put those things together and you'll get somewhere. You don't have to uh, order. John I, John, I think George is a fan of uh, skin in the game, uh, which I think underlies a lot of the uh, power of, of markets to deliver prosperity and more than prosperity. Uh, chances for human beings to flourish, which is what I think we all we all care about. I want to give you a chance to respond to the question. And by the way, it came from uh, uh, the viewer, Val. Val, thanks for the question about whether health care might be better provided by the government. Do you want to talk about that, John? So there are certain things that are better provided by government. I think national defense is a, an example. Uh, basically, externalities, that's what George is referring to. We, there's spillovers. There's things like that that are inherent. In those cases, there is a role for government. And I think George's example of a, of a climate is one. I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. When I grew up, you could not see the sun in the middle of the day. It was so, but people came together and they solved it. it. It wasn't a national policy at the time, it was local. And so that's the kind of thing that can also happen. Some of these externalities can be resolved by the private sector just well, but not all of them. And that's where you have a role for government, but it's frequently much more limited when you describe what the purpose of the role of government is. Earlier in the conversation, yeah, George, you mentioned the uh, size of the national debt, the deficit. Um, we live in a world where it appears neither party is excited about restraining the size of the, the, of the deficit. Uh, traditionally, Republicans have been worried about the debt and the deficit, uh, not so much lately. Uh, it does tend to vary with who's in the White House. But John, you've been a very um, eloquent voice about the dangers of debt. And those dangers are not seen yet. So people go, oh, we're fine. What's there to worry about? What's your answer to them? Well, there's ways to make the economy work better if you control the size of the debt. I've done research on that uh, recently with uh, John Cogan, for example, Daniel Hill. 
And so it's, it's a better system if you don't crowd out this very investment that will make us have more prosperity, raise incomes for everyone. And don't let, let's not forget about that. It's very important. But I would also say in the context of government policy, you know, less regulation, uh, and there, there has been a move towards that in the last few years. I think a tax system that it's, it's provides incentives, as George indicated, incentives are so important, is wiser than a tax system that stifles incentives. So there are things that we can do, and those don't require big government deficits. And so going forward, I think it's very important to get this uh, house in order, so to speak, to get the deficit under control. And, and maybe we're hearing a little bit about that. Uh, people don't want to hear it. It's, it's similar to, let's just have government solve these problems. But there's costs, and those have to be taken into account. They have been taken to, into account in the past. And we should not forget those going forward, that's for sure. George, are you worried about the national debt? Do you think yes. it's something we should be worried about? Yes. We Why? have so many resources. And the debt stands for having already spent a lot of them. And we also have a international trade problem as a result. I wrote a little piece with Barney Faustine, the late Barney Faustine. The shortest stop that ever appeared it was in the Washington Post. It said, if a country spends more than it produces, it will import more than it exports. But that's not economics, that's arithmetic. And they printed it. Mulvaney was around here. He was the first director of Office of Management, but I did not was the first one ever came by to talk. And I mentioned this. He said, yeah, I saw it. I put it on the president's desk, but he wouldn't read it. But I think somebody better read it because it's true. <laughs> yeah, well, economists are sometimes are the people who want to take away the punch bowl when the party gets going uh, because it often ends it. My point in this story wasn't economics. It was arithmetic. It was just yeah, plain no. arithmetic. But economists tend to do the counting and, and do the reminding and other people, the politicians don't always want to see the, they don't want to see the, how the things add up. Uh, we have a question from Peter about uh, corporate power. Uh, John, how do you feel about uh, corporations' power? A lot of people are worried they're, they have lobbying power, they have pricing power, and so on. Uh, are corporations too powerful in America right now? Is, is the role of corporations that we have now consistent with your vision of capitalism? So what I'm seeing now is, especially in this pandemic, is innovations coming out of businesses. I mentioned a few already, Zoom, for example, Facebook's going on more online. It, it, you can see it in this area out here all the time. And so I see the innovation coming. I, I don't want to stifle that. There are obviously concerns about competition when firms get too large. We have an antitrust system in the United States. It's, it, it's been applied. Uh, effectively, it can be taken out of control. You know, big is, is just not a bad thing. Big is sometimes better as you have enough competition is important, but you don't want to have vested interests stifling competition. And that can happen. There's no question about it. It goes back to the rule of law. We have a law about uh, firms, about size, about competition. We have formulas even that people used and the Justice Department can use. So we should continue with that. I think it's worked fine in the past. Technology changes a lot of these things. So you have to be aware of that and deal with it. And, and I think uh, watch over it. I used to well, be go ahead. of a large company for about eight years. And it was fun. We had strong competitors. We competed all over the world. So we had to be watching everything. We had to be watching the technology. I remember one time when it suddenly made possible to do things by remote control. I could watch you in Indonesia from San Francisco. And all of a sudden our whole process changed. We didn't have to send people out to look over something or other. A problem could be shown to us and we could correct it. And we did that right away, took advantage of that new thing. So, Big companies are good. 
and they, they, they can do a lot of stuff that nobody else can do. I would just add that I have no problem with companies getting big if they're big by making their customers happy. When they get big by getting special favors to the government, not so good. So uh, we ought to get rid of corporate subsidies of those kinds. Uh, yeah. I think just there aren't any subsidies, and we have plenty of competitors. Just because you're big doesn't mean you don't have competitors. Sometimes right. competitors are even small but affected. Uh, we have a question here from Charles uh, criticizing the idea of a carbon tax. Isn't that inconsistent with your view that prices should be set by the marketplace and not by government? Is it a form of price fixing? George, how would you justify uh, intervening in, in, uh, in the environment through a carbon tax? Well, I think I start with the notion that climate change is happening fast. And it's very debilitating. What to do about it? Rather than all these direct interventions that have been going on, restricting people, I just say, put a price on it. It's the same idea. Put a price out there and let people react to the price. And then you'll get somewhere. It's the price system all over again. So just to add- John, do you want to- the tax is, uh, is not a price control, it's a tax on top of market prices. So the market system is encouraged to work by this. It's not command and control. That's the, that's the danger. You have the government come in and saying this, but it, it's carbon tax is, is as neutral as you can get with respect to the price system. I first wrote about this in an article jointly with a man named Gary Becker. At the I've heard of him. Community king of conservative economics and he was a great guy university of chicago type i knew him there then he spent a lot of time at hoover and so we discussed this and came out wrote that article but that was a, a way of saying using don't try to regulate to get to this use the price system and let the price system do the work when i think about why i like capitalism and I'm not so fond of socialism, I think of the power of, of bottom up emergent systems. Uh, they solve problems without anyone being in charge, but they don't solve every problem. Um, things that are unowned, uh, things where there aren't property rights, uh, that would include the roads. Um, traffic is an emergent phenomenon, not so great in most large cities, uh, although pretty good right now in the middle of a pandemic, but in general, uh, well, emergent uh, solutions work. Traffic example. In Singapore first, and then I think they've adopted it in London, they put a price <coughs> on being in certain areas in order to restrict people from clogging up. And it's worked out pretty well. Here's the price system. John, do you want to comment on that? I think more generally, the more that you can use market principles, uh, the better off we are. And the more that when you see they're not being used to look at alternatives. I, I mentioned Pittsburgh long ago. And there, there's many examples of that. So that's the idea. The market markets work. It's fair. It's, there's no central intervention to screw things up. And the more we can do that, the better. That's my that's my modus operandi in this whole discussion. And again, the words socialism and capitalism are a bit confusing to people, quite frankly. It means different things to different people. So the more you can be specific, and we're specific in this book, Choose Economic Freedom, and, and other people have been in the past. Milton Friedman is a co-author, of course, and he was always very specific about what that meant. He wrote a book, Capitalism and Freedom, which laid out the, the specifics about what this whole idea debate was about. You should go back and read that as well. We only have about three minutes left, gentlemen. I got a question from Hannah, very appropriate question uh, in the audience, asking about the source of growing inequality in wealth. It's also growing inequality in income. Uh, do we want to lay that problem at capitalism's door and? Uh, and if, whether it's a capitalism store or not, sh what should we do about it, if anything? George, should we worry about inequality? Of course. 
And I think you have to read it <coughs> after a while. <coughs> Literally, it comes down to poor education. <coughs> Our public school system does not give people a good education. And if they, we had greater use of charter schools, a freedom of choice, education quality would improve. It's interesting is we had this phenomenon of black lives recently. But if you go into a black community, you find they desperately want freedom of choice and education, but they, they just get what the education union hands them. And so they don't get very much. So I think if you got better education, you'd solve a lot of these problems. Well, George, like you, I'm more worried about the people at the bottom having more opportunity than taking away opportunity for people at the top, unless it's been granted through, again, some kind of special crony privilege. John, your thoughts on inequality? And you've got yes. one minute, so just solve uh, it Education is so important, and George, I just have to second that. We, we don't have an equal opportunity educational system in the U.S. To some extent, it's because we don't allow enough choice, we don't allow charter schools. It's... It's amazing to me how much discussion of inequality has arisen and how little discussion education has been associated with. There's something wrong with that picture. And the more we can bring attention to the education, for whatever means, the better off we'll be. Yeah, we've betrayed three generations of the children of, of the poor in America's cities. And I think it's, uh, I don't, like you, I don't understand why it isn't a full court 24-7 project. Uh, instead, it's the occasional reform is tried here or there. Most of them don't work at the national level, and we ought to be encouraging innovation through trial and error at the, at the school and local level, and it's a tragedy. George and John, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for promoting it. It was terrific. It was terrific. Thank you, Russ. Thank you very much.